Sex. <laughs> Any questions? I had a bet with my cohort, and they were like, you're not going to do that. Yes, I've got to do that. I have to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me with my cough, by the way. I'm the one you've been hearing the whole time cough. Um, I like to say to Meg and my kids, um, I don't get sick very often, actually. And I take this line from, from Dwight Schrute from The Office. If I'm sick, you've all been dead for weeks. So, sorry for everybody. Uh, the title, I don't think we've displayed it, but the title I came up with for this is called Gospel Sexuality and Culture Narratives, Which Will You Follow? So I'm continuing, hopefully, at least in my mind and for some of you, the gospel sexuality stuff we did earlier in the season. Um, and I'm really going to take a spin on Song of Solomon that you might not have thought of. And when you get into your small groups, you can, you know, you can banish me to heresy, that's fine. But um, just... Follow me for a little bit here, and I, I really submit this charitably. I'm, I, I'm a little bit nervous about this because when you combat or try to combat current cultural narratives on sexuality, it's dangerous territory. It's, it's a slippery slope. There are friends and cousins and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and all that kind of stuff, and none of that I'm trying to say you should point a finger at that person. What I'm trying to say is maybe the gospel doesn't say, maybe the gospel helps us say those things are false and this is truth and let's enjoy that truth, right? So let me give it a shot. <clears throat> um, my, so Song of Solomon provides a vivid, often confusing look into the romantic relationship between a man and a woman. It's not arranged as one linear story and neither is this talk. We're gonna weave a lot in this talk. But a series of poems that weaves in a nonlinear fashion with a couple often longing and searching for each other. If you had a chance to look at the Gospel Project's uh, video on this, they really did a great job, especially with their visuals. They show this vine and trellis that keeps weaving in and out. And that really is how uh, Song of Solomon works. It's almost like it's a series of love songs or poems that are like on some kind of random repeat on your Pandora station or Spotify or whatever you use. And then it just kind of ends. Like it just ends like one of those songs that doesn't have an ending, it's on the radio, it just kind of keeps repeating the same verse and it just goes quiet. That's kind of how Song of Solomon finishes up. But as always in God's word, our Father is often saying far more than the obvious and his ultimate goal is for us to know him more with greater passion and depth. Placing the word gospel as I did in, in the title of this in front of something is very much in vogue right now and I'm guilty of that. But let's take a moment to see how God lays hints about his gospel and shares the gift of sexuality in Song of Solomon. More importantly, let's examine how these both stand apart from our culture's narratives on personal fulfillment and sexuality as identity. <clears throat> So to start, let's take a couple steps back in time with a, with a personal story of mine. Uh, right after college, I went to Des Moines, Iowa for my first career stop after college with the Boy Scouts of America. I grew up in the scouting program and it was a great opportunity to help the program grow uh, in that area through fundraising, youth recruitment, and planning highlight events. And fundraising is what I ended up becoming. That's, that's my career right now um, in, in a different field, not with the Boy Scouts. But I was fortunate to be matched up with a supervisor who remains a friend to this day. He became like an older brother, and I really valued his wisdom and friendship. <clears throat> Coming out of college, though, I had continued to hang on to my understanding of modern quote-unquote romance. In short, the weekly goal was to meet a girl at a bar, maybe go home with her that night or not, but in all cases, show the minimal interest needed to make her pursue me. It was uh, really messed up, and I was clearly not a follower of Christ. Uh, fast forward for a second, when I met uh, Meg, she made me pursue her, and that was so intoxicating. <laughs> uh, and it was really good for my soul. It was what was needed. Uh, back to Des Moines, Iowa. See, you notice, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, around the year 2000, by God's grace, he continued to press his truth and grace through my family as they were coming to Christ one by one back home in La Crosse, Wisconsin. 
Before I made the wonderful decision to follow Christ in April of 2001, I started wrestling with the way I acted toward women and my messed up views on romance. I recall asking my friend and supervisor how someone my, my age might even meet a love interest if they didn't want to do so in a bar and moreover wanted to wait until after marriage to be sexual. His honest answer was, I really don't know. And this was from a man who was loving and faithful in his marriage and active in his Methodist church. So for both of us, the cultural narrative on love and romance had squeezed out God's beautiful message that we were sinners saved by grace and that we didn't need to find out our worth in sex and sexuality. <clears throat> and while that was 20 years ago, the cultural narrative that sex and sexuality are among a person's defining characteristics still have a powerful hold on people today. In mentoring young men who desire to follow Christ, I've encountered two main defeaters, and there's many, but at least two main defeaters that try to disqualify these men from experiencing the mystic union of Christian marriage and its reflection of Christ in his church. The first one that I've heard, my past is so icky that no one will want to be married to me. I'm damaged goods. The second sounds like, because I've experienced same-sex attraction or issues with my own sexuality, I'm disqualified from the opportunity of Christian marriage with a person of the opposite sex. And again, these are not the only defeaters, but these are just really two main ones that come back to me often. Now mind you, these aren't individuals who are wondering out loud if they possess the gift and calling of singleness. These are young men who want to be in a Christian marriage to a woman, but believe, because of our culture, that they are unqualified to do so. So I'm going to have, for those who have Bibles or are they able to pull up uh, scripture on their phone, I'm going to have a lot of reading here, and I'm going to take volunteers for that, okay? <clears throat> and we're going to go Solomon, New Testament, back and forth. But if you could open up to Song of Solomon chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, I'll take somebody to read that. Is that going to be hard for the video to pick up or just go with it okay so chapter one verses five through seven if somebody wants to brian right. yeah i am very dark but lovely O daughters of jerusalem like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of solomon do not gaze at me because i am dark because the sun has looked upon me my mother's sons were angry with me they made me keeper of the divine vineyards but my own vineyard i have not kept tell me you who my soul loves, where you where you pastor your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who fails herself beside the flocks of your Thanks, Brian. So note back in verse five. She is dark but lovely. Dark because she's worked many hours in the sun, she's not dainty or fragile, and her mother's sons despised her by making her uh, keeper of the vineyards, so even more outdoor labor. And she was not able to, quote unquote, keep her own vineyard. In other words, her hard labor never afforded her the opportunity to take care of herself, and her appearance showed that. <clears throat> so it's no different today. Beauty and socioeconomic class are often related. If you have money, you don't need to work, and you can spend a greater percentage of time and money on being physically attractive. He, on the other hand, is a shepherd. This was blue collar work and physical labor, and you spent your days and nights outdoors surrounded by smelly, dim-witted sheep. Now, this isn't exactly working on Wall Street with a weekend home in the Hamptons. Uh, but when they see each other, what do they see? Uh, if someone could read, stay in chapter one, read verses eight through 10, please. If you do not know most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherd. I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. Thank you, Meg. And let's do verse 16 back here. Okay. Behold, you're beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Thank you. And throughout Song of Solomon, they go back and forth, enjoying each other and enjoying their attraction to each other. But again, according to even the standards of that time, 
they may only be attractive to each other. Um, pausing there for a second, does anyone recall the movie Shallow Hal? Yeah. 2001? Okay. It's 18, 19, or 17 years old, so I get that. But So it came out back 2001, starred Jack Black, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Jason Alexander. The premise was that this guy, Hal, played by Jack Black, was extremely superficial, especially regarding his physical expectations of women. He then has this mystical encounter with the motivational speaker, Tony Robbins, and from there forward, Hal has the ability to see internal beauty. In the words of Robbins, Hal has been hypnotized by culture to only see external beauty, and Robbins de-hypnotizes him from the bondage. In a critical scene between Hal and his friend, this friend played by Jason Alexander, who was uh, uh, George on Seinfeld, <coughs> Hal says, what difference does it make? I saw a beautiful woman. So think about that. Back to Song of Solomon, from the scriptures, all we know is that they're attracted only to each other. And there are strong hints that they may not be attractive to others because of their appearance due to physical labor and their socioeconomic status. <clears throat> Rosario Butterfield is a renowned teacher of the Bible and has been featured at many Gospel Coalition conferences. She shared openly of her life as a lesbian activist before becoming a Christian, wife, and mother. One thing she is famous for saying is that Christian marriage means being attracted to one person of the opposite sex and not all persons of the opposite sex. So to those who feel unqualified for Christian marriage because of their struggles with anything related to sexuality, note that those who find themselves attracted to all or many of the opposite sex are no more qualified than those who are only attracted to a few or just one. Before I became a follower of Christ, I had eyes for every woman. I was no more qualified for the mystical union that displays Christ in his church than the person who struggles to be attracted to anyone of the opposite sex. Or, does not, or, or a person who does not feel attractive at all. If you're following my line of thinking here, it's Christ and his place in your life that makes you ready to reflect him in marriage. And I'm honestly not saying this is easy, folks. Myself and what Rosario Butterfield are, are trying to say is that Christ and his gospel are the key in your strength. Uh, being heterosexual is not the key. What God helped me overcome was my understanding that I was normal, quote unquote, because I was attracted to all women. But by his grace, my heart is drawn to only one. So keep in mind, what I'm trying to say here is we're all broken. In the Jewish tradition... Song of Solomon was considered an allegory of Israel and God and their love relationship to each other. In the Christian tradition, Song of Solomon is viewed as a reflection of Christ and his church. So now another reading here. If somebody can turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll take a volunteer to read verses 25 through 33. I can do it. Thank you. You said 25 to 33? Yes. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Thank you. There's a phrase in Song of Solomon that is often repeated. Can anyone tell me what that is? I'll try. <laughs> I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Sounds a lot like Ephesians 5.28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. 
He who loves his wife loves himself. So back again to Song of Solomon. Let's go to chapter 8. We read that, that this love is intense and dangerous. It is a gift from God. And I'll take a volunteer to read verses 6 and 7 in Song of Solomon chapter 8. Thank you. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Your love, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. Ooh, thank you. Quote, love is strong as death. How about death on a cross? Quote, jealousy is fierce as the grave. In the Old Testament, God describes himself as a jealous God. Jealous for what? For us, his love. And he was willing to allow his son to go to the grave to make us holy so that we can be with him forever. And when you think of all the ways culture wants to disqualify you from experiencing this gift of his love, what we must remember is that God is the one who makes what is ordinary or unclean like the two people in Song of Solomon, to be holy. For our final reading, please turn to Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16, and I'll take a volunteer to read that one. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. I'll do it. Thanks, Ben. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing for it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Thanks, Ben. And in case you didn't hear it, verse 15 is what's key here for me. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. After this, the the first century church really started to have a focus on Gentiles. They weren't afraid to go to the Gentiles. So these verses, though, on the surface are about food. But like Song of Solomon, they're filled with allegory. In this brief story, God demonstrates to Peter that he has chosen to make all his creation, just like you, clean again. So for your reflection questions, uh, I've given you three that I, I value that you go through. How has culture over God defined for you what is clean or unclean in sexuality and thereby taken the place of the gospel in this area of your life? Second, what does culture want you to believe is most important about sexuality? And finally, how does the love of God and Christ's call to pick up your cross daily show you that he has the true gifts and resources to overcome all cultural narratives about sexuality? Thank you. 